afternoon, and welcome to Lenses Youth Conference. We, yeah, we are so happy to have each of you here, and I believe that it's going to be a great weekend. Um, we do have a few changes to announce. I think you're aware of one of them. We had planned our conference um, with Dr. Thane Yuri, and he had some unexpected circumstances arise this week and was unable to attend. So we have the pleasure of having Reverend Marshall Dagg with us, which some of you know because he's spoken at KMBC before, and he will also be back for youth camp this summer. So we're very happy that he was able to jump in and join us for this weekend. <clears throat> Another change from the communications that we have rolled out, we were planning to have the zip line activity open this afternoon because that's awesome, but unfortunately it has, is going to rain us out. <clears throat> so the zip line will not be this afternoon. Um, we are going to open it tomorrow after the brunch. So the conference kind of officially closes at brunch. If your schedule does allow you to stay after the brunch, we will open the zip line after brunch. And so you'll still get an opportunity to ride the zip line and participate in that, even though the rain's not helping us much today. If you have not registered for the conference, and that is to fill out the registration card at the front table, both youth and or adults, we would encourage you to do that um, in between one of the sessions and make sure that you get those filled out. We have the talent competition this afternoon at three o'clock for sophomores, juniors, and seniors. If you are planning to participate in that and either did not fill out the online registration or did not register for that at the booth when you came in, please stop by and let us know. We would love to get you uh, into that talent competition and have you participate. We have a number of people signed up already and we're looking forward to an excellent talent competition. So once again, we're very excited to have you all here for the Lenses Conference. We're looking forward to it. I believe it's gonna be great. But before we get started, Julie is going to come with a special announcement. Hello everybody, I'm really excited to tell you about our new merch. We have a hoodie, this hoodie is $20, and we have a t-shirt, this t-shirt is $12, and it also has our mission statement on the back. So you guys are gonna be some of the first people to be able to see and receive this new merch and buy some. We will be open tonight from 5.15 to 6.15, and if, for any of you who are at youth camp, this is going to be in the snack shack, but for any of you who don't know, this is going to be in the coffee shop, which is called Leela G's. It's got like a, a hood thing over the front that says Leela G's. It's got a porch over there, over by the student center in the basement there. If you need any help, ask any of our students. They should know where it is or come and find me, and I will direct you towards there, and we are really excited about this new merch. Thank you. Well, hey, once again, man, this is exciting. You guys thrilled to be here? I know I am. There's a lot, yeah, sure, yeah, let's go. A lot of things to be excited about this weekend, but what I'm probably most excited about is to hear from the Lord and experience Him. And I hope that's part of why you guys are here as well. So we're going to begin this, this, uh, this service, this session with worship, because God is here, God is speaking, and God is worthy of our worship today. So let's stand and let's sing to him today. Let's sing together. He's worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Jesus, the name above every other name. 
conference. My name is Dr. Rob Popeye, and it's a joy to have you on our campus. We've been praying for you, praying for this event, and we're so excited this morning, this afternoon actually, to have Reverend Marshall Day with us. And Reverend Day is the pastor of, actually the founding pastor of Harbors Point Church and Methodist Church, and he's also ordained as an elder with the Association of Independent Methodists. He also teaches religion at Calhoun Community College, which is one of the largest Community College is in Alabama. Um, he is also a pastoral fellow with the John and Charles Wesley Center for Christian Thought and Apologetics, dear friends of mine. Marshall has served as a lecturer not only at Emmaus University but other colleges, not only here in the States but also overseas. One thing I love about Marshall, he's a dear friend of mine. And uh, when uh, I needed someone to step in many, many years ago when we worked together at the Salvation Army. Marshall was my guy. He, he's jumped in there and served many, many times, many, many ministries, ministry opportunities. He has a love for Jesus and a great family, and we're blessed to have Marshall Dagg with us. Would you welcome him as he comes and shares this afternoon? All right, well... It is good to be with you this afternoon. Uh, my day started at, what was it, 4.20 this morning or 4.15 and I uh, got out of bed and or actually left the house at that time. So it's good to finally be somewhere for just a moment. It took me about six hours to, to get here. And uh, interestingly, I ended up getting lost in the mountains of Kentucky uh, for just a minute, just a minute, okay? Now you might say, well, how in the world can you get lost with one of these things, right? Well, did you know that there are certain parts of Kentucky that don't have service, you know? And, um, and so I found myself in one of those places, and there I was scooting through some sort of, uh, I don't know, I was out, it was near War Creek or something like this, or, I guess, as an area, um, because I finally saw a church, and it was called War Creek, and I was wanted to be a welcoming church, but I don't know if that one is or not. <laughs> It didn't sound like it to me, so I got a little more in there. But I'm telling you, the road was pothole filled. It was a one-lane road, you know. And, uh, and it, was, it was, I was thinking, surely I'm, I'm in the wrong place. But notice this, the last thing my GPS had told me was like, get on this road, you know. 
And so I got on that road and then I began to question everything because I'm not kidding you. It was literally a one lane road with, I mean, there were parts of the road that had washed out and all these, it was, it was getting precarious for a minute. And there was, uh, people playing basketball in the street at one point. Um, you know, it's a road that's not used much, I guess, you know, and what's, uh, what, what struck me as I, as I got here and finally made it was sometimes we all get lost. You know, in fact, the scripture speaks of our condition as one of getting lost and being lost. And, you know, sometimes it's a sort of external lostness, you know, like I was place wise. Now, I generally knew where I was. I was in the United States. I was in Kentucky. I was probably headed in the general right direction. In fact, even if I wanted to turn around, it's on a one lane road. Wasn't going to happen, you know. And so, and the last thing, I, the last direction I had was actually go down that road. So I trusted until, you know, my phone woke up again and was like, hey, you're almost there, man, you know? So I took a turn and I remembered where you and I had, you had taught me some things about the river that was close to here. I don't know the geography, okay? So I'm still in some sense lost. I don't know exactly, I'm not precise on everything, okay? But there's also another kind of lostness that we experience. And, and that is a lostness that's internal, right? So, so you can be externally lost, and um, I could have probably stopped and asked directions, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, maybe. <clears throat> um, but, but internally lost, that means you're around other people. It means your GPS is working on your phone and all, but you still don't feel like you really know where you are. You know what I mean? You ever been there before? And if we're honest, we all have. And interestingly, as we grow and mature, we experience various phases of lostness. Trust me, when you get your, uh, when you, uh, let's see, your juniors and seniors mainly, so when you get to college, okay, it'll feel like you're lost again, right? Like all of a sudden you got to relearn. You know how it works, right? You're in high school. You're finally a senior. You kind of walk in that last year like a boss. You know, you're like, yeah, I know how this workplace works. I got it. I know everybody. You know, but then you go to college, right? And then you don't know anybody, okay? You don't know how things work. You're nervous about uh, Bagby's class, you know, and you don't even know which one it is. Um, I don't mean what class, the, which guy, you know? <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, you're worried about, like, what's the test going to be like? You're lost, right, again. So, and then, and then you, you, you make it all the way up to being maybe one of you as a senior uh, here at KNBC, you know, and you're like, man, you know, kind of like, I got this down. I just, you know. He's not so difficult, you know, of a guy uh, or, or a gal who teaches. You got it down, right? But then you get your first job. And let me tell you, you get lost again, right? <laughs> Trust me. And then you just, you get married. You're lost about how to do that, right? Uh, you lose a friend. Someone betrays you. And they've never done that before. Okay? Yeah, it's a new place. It's a new place. And you know what? You might have some direction, you know, and... We have various types of maps, and this is our premier map right here, okay? But man, you start searching like, where am I? What's going on, you know? And so one of the things that uh, that the Lord has laid on my heart just to, I don't know, get us to think about and get us to consider and maybe explore together in just these three short sessions that we have is just this idea that, yeah, you know, our world is lost. That's what we're told. And as Christians, we're supposed to be the found ones, right? And so we can talk about worldview. I could sit here and give you, you know, here's point one and here's what you need. Here's a list and, you know, we could have PowerPoint. But if you want to wrap it all up, what we need more than a map, now hear me on this one. We need more than the map More than the text is the person, and that's Jesus, the shepherd, the shepherd of the text, right? The one the text is pointing directly at, God himself. He is the maker and the creator of all things. So what I want to do is actually, so in this session, I'll just give you kind of the map (laughs) um, that we're going to be abiding by in in my three sessions is this. The first is we're going to look at creation, all right? And we've already started kind of doing that by by me telling you a story of being lost in creation, right? Uh, 
And then the second was we're going to look at Christ. All right. So tonight we're going to look, look at Christ. And then we're going to look at our commitment to this thing of worldview, which ultimately comes down to Jesus Christ. All right. So we, uh, I want to explore a little bit about this idea of worldview at all. And, and, and I love, thanks for the um, song that you guys just sang, because it really is perfect. We, um, we sometimes think of worship just as like music. And of course, that's wrong. You know, uh, obviously, worship is more than music. Um, and other times, we think of preaching as worship. And of course, preaching is not all there is to worship, right? Holy communion is worship. Baptism is worship. Uh, prayer is worship, maybe the primary form of worship, but also uh, what we're doing here, which is not really a sermon, all right? So I've not, I don't have just a sermon for you today. It's more lecture style, all right? So you're kind of, we're getting our feet wet in just a semi-dialogue because I'm kind of talking to you, but rhetorically, right? And I may even ask a couple of times, like, hey, what do you think this means, all right? I'm just kind of still fill out the crowd. I don't know you that well, and you don't know me that well, so I don't want things to get out of hand. Poke, I'll never invite me back, right? <clears throat> so, so what we're gonna what we're gonna do is kind of exactly what the song said. Said it said this: open our eyes, right? But you know what I noticed when I looked around though? Open our eyes. People are doing this. Now think about it. Why? Why? Because <laughs> the kind of eyes that we really want open are not the ones that you see me with but the ones by faith that we see what cannot be seen with the eyeball, right? Which is why we then would close our eyes and say, open my eyes, Lord, right? Now, so that's been my prayer, actually, is just that. That's why when we sing the song, I'm like, oh, man, this is perfect. Uh, one last thing, show me your wonder. The song speaks of wonder. That's also one of the things that the Lord placed here for me to share with you is this. We live in a wonderful world. Now, I know it's sin-ridden. I know there's darkness. But you know who created this world? God did. And he likes it. He likes that we have a body. He likes that we get to eat. In fact, I was just reading uh, Jesus when he came back from the dead, resurrection. In fact, I'm preaching on it Sunday. Um, and in fact, last Sunday was the same sort of reading, but from John, this one's from Luke, and he shows up, and you know what he does? He not only tells them, you see my wounds, you see, here and here. Thomas, go ahead and put your finger in it like you wanted to do, okay? Not only that, but what does he say in the Luke version? He says, anybody have any fish? Bring it on. And he ate the fish. What a bizarre thing to do, right? Like, <laughs> Here's Jesus showing up in a glorified body post-resurrection, and he wants to eat something. And he wants to eat fish, you know, which is, my dad always says that's why he fishes, you know, is because he knows that's the one uh, food that Jesus approves of, you know. <laughs> He's a wild man. Some of you know him, so it makes sense. But, yeah, Jesus eats food, and he fellowships with them. And, and think about this. He then uses one of the most basic things that we need to survive, right? To enter us into the faith with baptism. And then elements of a supper, right? The bread and the wine, okay? <laughs> which, which wine has to do with celebration, juice, whatever you want to say there. It has to do with celebration. It's not water, notice. He could have said bread and water. No, 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 no. The wine is for celebration, the bread is basic food, okay? So again, we have, he gives us a meal to remember him by, all right? Now, you say, how does that connect to wonder? Well, I like to eat, you know? And it's an awesome thing. And I like to do certain things where I hang out and fellowship with people that I enjoy being around, like you guys, right? And it's fun to do. And so what I want to help us capture is, because I know we can, we can sit here and say, yeah, man, when worldview, when we think about the world, so much bad stuff going on in the world. But you know what? We're supposed to be people with good news. Now, I know in order to have good news, you got to have bad news. I get it. Totally. I'm with you. But some of us never get around 
to the good news. Or we paint the bad news so bad and dig the hole so deep that we're not able to come out of it. Our gospel, our good news uh, doesn't match it. And I want us to sort of recover that to say, you know what? This is an amazing world that God has created. And it's been, like for you juniors and seniors, you know, you're, you're what, 15 to 18 years old? Well, I've got a, uh, a, a what is it? <laughs> I have five kids, so bear with me for a second. I have a 17-year-old, right? And, uh, you know, he's right there, man. He's experiencing new things, driving. I remember when I first started driving, that's an awesome thing. Didn't you like driving when you first started driving? Absolutely, you know. In fact, I actually still like driving. That's what's nuts. After all, I'm 42 years old, and I've been driving since I was 15 years old, and I've driven a lot, and I still like it, actually. I, I do. This morning, in darkness, as the sun was coming up, I'm scooting along down the road. It's a beautiful thing. I just started thinking, wow, we get to live and get to see another day. Like, you're here. You're here, right? We're here, all right? Everybody look around like, yep, I'm here, okay? Let's, let's try to recover the wonder. Let the Holy Spirit this weekend, capture your heart in wonder, all right? Uh, that, that's another one of my prayers here. Okay, so let, let's, uh, let's jump in then to uh, the material at hand. <clears throat> in dealing with creation, uh, there's no better place, of course, to begin than, um, than Genesis 1, right? <laughs> so, so you can turn to Genesis 1 here. And here's the first thing I want to say about really... Uh, the first few verses here. So if you just go to Genesis 1, and if you, if you would, bring your Bible to these sessions. Um, and I know uh, Bagby would like for you to do the same, I'm sure. So <laughs> um, <clears throat> notice in the beginning, and you already know this, but let's look at it again together. And this is the NIV. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. When we talk about worldview, we can, we can mean a lot of things, you know, and maybe, maybe you've heard that term, worldview, right? And maybe you've experienced different people's worldview. Uh, I teach religion, so, you know, I teach all, kind, I teach all the religions, the major world religions, and uh, not that I'm an expert, but I certainly know quite a bit about each of them. And they have a different worldview. Every single one of them, we could say, has a different worldview. An atheist is going to have a different worldview than a Christian is, okay? A Muslim is going to have a different worldview than a Hindu does, all right? And so when we start looking at worldview, maybe we could just simply say that worldview is our perspective of the world. I mean, that's, you know, goodness, if we're just, just trying to be simple that's pretty simple, right? And it's also limited, though. Because think about it. If it's just from your perspective of the world, and it's supposed to be a world view, oh, man, that, I mean, I'll speak for myself. Like, that's a limited, I've never been to France, for instance, you know? I don't know how to speak French. I don't know French culture necessarily, even though that's where my last name came from, you know? I ought to, maybe, but I just haven't got around to doing that. I don't, I don't know anything about it, actually. I don't know the geography, et cetera, all right? Um, there's a lot of things I don't know because I'm limited to my two eyes and what I've been able to experience in 42 years, which is not a lot, all right? Uh, you may say, man, that's ancient, bro. And, you know, <laughs> I get it. When I was your age, I thought that too, you know? And then now I'm my age and I don't think that, you know? <laughs> that's, why, that's why when you move up in age, all the other ages, you're like, oh, yeah, 30s, that's nothing, man, you know? <laughs> now I'm like, yeah, 40s or 50s, are, that's not nothing, you know? So, right, it, it's... It's this perspective that's very limited. So we need to be humble, for one, as we approach the idea of having a worldview and developing a worldview, which at the end of the day is exactly what KMBC exists for, is to shape the way you see the world, all right? Um, and the way they do it, I'm sure, is by shaping you. <laughs> uh, by shaping you, because we can't, I can't change you. I can't change this room by looking out upon it, but I can understand this room better and better as I understand and develop myself, all right? And so as you develop, you're going to see the world differently. 
You say, I don't know what you mean by that. Well, a simple illustration is uh, when you were five years old, uh, probably all adult men were daddies to you, right? Like, that's all you know. Like, yeah, that, that guy's a daddy, you know? Now, when you get older, you realize, like, not all adult men have children, right? And so that becomes apparent. But it's not apparent when you're small, right, when you're little. Same thing with marriage. Like, you had an idea of marriage at 10 that when you're 20 is different. And when you're 30 and actually married, it's even more different, right? And then at 40, and you keep going up, right? Like, we keep cycling through these things. And what, notice, marriage itself doesn't change, it is what it is, or what God says it is, okay? Our perspective changes, though. <laughs> uh, same thing with love, same thing with hope, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, so <laughs> we need a little humility when we're approaching the subject of, of, of worldview. Now, this fella, Socrates, said something that's important uh, 2,400 years ago, all right? So he, was, he lived about 500 and something years before Jesus. And uh, here's what he says. The unexamined life is not worth living. And the Bible is going to back him up on this, okay? Because before him, even further back, Solomon speaks of wisdom and folly or foolishness. And the wise person always examines their life and then is able to examine things in the world. And rightfully so, either right or wrong, right? Wise or foolish. So notice what Proverbs 4, 25 through 27 says. And think, and think about me getting lost in the in Kentucky mountains as you're listening to this as well. Look straight ahead. Because <laughs> trust me, if I would have looked away like, man, I wonder if I'm at, I would have been off this little, little road. I'm telling you. Even though I have a smaller car than normal, I'm not in my truck. I'm in this little bitty car. So I was able to felt a lot more comfortable. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Uh, we all have some. It doesn't matter how old you are. You have something that's before you that, that you're going to be entering into. All right. Uh, what is it for you that you are looking forward to? All of us have something. Maybe it's just the next thing dinner, right? <laughs> or playtime. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Now, Jesus is going to come after Solomon, after Socrates, all right? Socrates is a Greek philosopher, by the way, if you don't know. And he says this, there's a wise and there's a foolish builder, now, you tell me, what, what does the wise person build his life upon? The rock. the rock, right? Good, yeah, so you know, you know. And then what does the foolish person build their life on? The sand, the sand right? Have you ever, um, you guys are way up here, man, so like, I don't, do you get to the beach much, you know? Uh, we love the beach, and so, and we're only like five hours from it. Um, we try to go at least once a year, and I've built some sandcastles. You know what? Not one of them is still standing. Not one. <laughs> Even if I put it way up here, you know what I'm saying? It, it's, sand is just, man. And, and you know, one time I built this beautiful turtle. You know what I mean? I just had a lot of time, and I did this turtle. It was like a sea turtle. It was perfect, I thought. And, you know, next thing I know, one of my nephews my brother's kids, you know, always has to be them, right? <laughs> Especially this one. <laughs> you know those kinds of ones. And man, that dude just was jumping on my turtle. Just destroyed it, you know, just destroyed. Now, if it would have been built out of rock, what would happen if he jumped on it? Not much, right? <laughs> uh, rock doesn't move, okay? <laughs> that's, that's kind of the point with rock. Rock is always trying to just get to the center of the earth, which is why if it tumbles, it's always going to go to the lowest place and then just settle, all right? It's settled, okay? It's not going to crumble like that. And so what Jesus is saying is, listen, you need, because trust me, what he says is when the storms come and when the rains come, because you know what? In your life, it doesn't matter uh, how good you are, <laughs> Uh, how 
carefully you are trying to follow the path, did you know that storms will come anyway? Did you know that? In fact, Jesus leads his disciples into a storm. <laughs> he knew it was coming, right? And then there he was walking on the water, you know. People, they thought he was a ghost, just like they thought after his resurrection, interestingly. Um, you're going to go through storms. And don't think when you go, why me? Why? No, 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 no. It's a Job. Job should have taught us that lesson a long time ago, but also Jesus. Jesus comes, who is God in the flesh, and doesn't he go through storms? I just mentioned one, all right? But also the bad kind of storms, as in betrayal of his closest friends. Abandonment. Uh, the mockery of a trial being made fun of, spat upon, and of course suffering and then dying for us. Uh, he went through some storms, all right? We will too. That's why we must build on the rock. Now, of course, the rock is Jesus, all right? The rock is our foundation. Our ultimate cornerstone is Jesus. And then his apostles, those earliest apostles, which means that the doctrine that we even have today and that is represented here in the scripture is that apostolic doctrine, that witness of the first ones who saw the marks on his body, that saw him eat. If you notice, Peter and all these guys, when they talk about Jesus, we ate with him after his resurrection. It's like it's a, it's a proof point. In other words, that means he bodily rose again, like that body, okay? Which brings us into another whole thing because a lot of us think, you know, the whole point of life is to go to heaven in some sort of uh, ghostly existence. And I'm here to tell you, that ain't happening. That's only for a time when we're without our body. At the general resurrection, the term general means everybody's going to rise again. Some to eternal damnation and others to eternal life. There's no other way, though. <laughs> it's only one of those, okay? But everybody, he's going to put us back together, all right? That's because we were meant for this body because guess what? He's the one who designed us. So when we, again, when we denigrate the body or when we, when we discount the body in these sorts of ways and even speak about it, we need to get that corrected, especially because, listen, listen, we're not just spiritualist, okay? Like a worldview doesn't mean, oh, yeah, you just have to see you know, angels everywhere you look. No, that's not what we're talking about. You're not, probably never going to see an angel. I don't know. Maybe you would. The Bible says probably won't know if you did because they're incognito, you know, okay? And it's going to be like, boo, it scares half to death, which is why every time an angel does show up in the Bible, the first thing is that fear not because people are just shaking in their boots, okay? Um, they're otherworldly, in other words. We're, we're used to things in this world, right? Which is why when Jesus is transfigured, same sort of thing goes on, right? When he comes back in glorified glorify body, same sort of thing. He's not the same. And that's the same thing that's going to happen to us. When we, Paul says this, when we see him, we'll be like him. He's like, I don't know all the details, but we'll be like him. Okay, post-resurrection. Get our body back. We're going to talk more about that on the, the last session. So just but keep that in the hopper. When we build on the rock, then we put our life on him. And he ain't going nowhere, Okay. No one can destroy him because him, Jesus, God. Okay, and that's impossible to destroy God. Also, Paul mentions that Jesus is the master builder. All right? and he's building up his church, and we as Christians are uh, his church, his body in the world. All right, so what I want to act like is, is a guide for you, okay? Now, I know I just said I got lost, right? So I'm not the best guide, okay? <laughs> I like to stick close to the map, uh, you know? Uh, but, but I want to guide us through just sort of an understanding of what a worldview might incorporate, all right? Because so, the whole thing, you know, lenses uh, is where we're, we're probably envisioning, you know, an atheist when he looks around this room is going to see people in a certain way. Maybe a, you know, scientific, reductionist, materialist sort of way, all right? Which is just to say, when an, uh, if an atheist is being true to what he believes, all right, you're just a pile of cells, just an amalgamation of atoms that for whatever reason is in some sort of order and unity, but will pass away and there's nothing else after that. Um, 
oh, that's, that's a way to look at the world. The question we have to begin to ask with, with atheistic worldviews and things like this is this. Does it match up with reality? Does it actually answer all the questions that, that bother us? Okay? So, so an atheist, you know, um, well, let me tell you this. A worldview normally has three key questions. Where do we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going, right? So you can talk about our origin, right? Okay, then you can talk about our purpose, and then you can speak about our end. Where, where is this all going? What is this all pointing to? Uh, where do we end up? And, um, you know, for an atheist, let's just answer those real quick. Um, where do we come from? Nowhere. You're just an accident at best. You may not even be anything at all, actually. <laughs> um, so you came from nowhere. Uh, why are you here? No reason. There's no reason at all. Just kind of eke out some sort of life that you can construct yourself, but there's no purpose in life, of course. Uh, purpose would mean that somebody had a design in mind, right? <laughs> Uh, when things have purpose, that means somebody created it for something, right? Just like a cell phone is not used as a hammer. The purpose is to communicate or to talk or receive things, right? Uh, it, has a, it has a maker that made it a certain way, and therefore it has a purpose, right? Uh, the third one, where are we going? Nowhere. So came from nothing. I'm here for no reason. I'm going nowhere. I would wake up to that every day, right? No, of course not. That's, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Nobody actually lives like that. that. That's the point is, atheists are actually just hypocrites, okay? They're borrowing, okay, purpose in their life and enjoying all these things, okay, but they're not being truthful about reality, about the way that they're describing it, okay? Now, they're getting their jollies by going on TV shows and writing books and, you know, speaking like I'm doing and you're getting real, you know, confusing people. They love it. You know, scrambling all of the minds, right? Like, they, but they're enjoying purpose, something that God created, okay? But in a negative way, in a wrong way, in a blind way, we, we might would say. Ignorant, okay, of the truth. But in fact, not just ignorant, suppressing the truth in ungodliness. Um, because you see, even for an atheist or, or you know, insert whoever, agnostic, which just means you don't know. I mean, if we did those three things again, it's, it's, you know, ag, you know, because anybody, you know, well, I shouldn't say that because I don't want you raising your hands and stuff. But people say that they're agnostic, okay? But if you actually start asking them, they're really not, because they just think that's a cool word, okay? I, trust me, I have college students come in and out all the time. They just think they're agnostic, okay? But agnostic just means you don't know. So again, let's do it again. You ready? Where did we come from? I don't know. <laughs> Why are you here? I don't know. Where are you going? I don't know. Again, you can't, you don't live like that. Okay? You actually don't live like that. No one actually, they're all hypocrites. That's the problem, okay? Is, is nobody, and nobody likes hypocrites, not even hypocrites. But they can't see it because they're blind and lost. All right, and that's where the scripture comes in. That's where we as Christians and our witness come in. Um, all right, so, so we can keep, and Muslim, you go, you go down the list. We could all answer, and we could, we could sit here and uh, analyze and do all these things. And that would be fun for me, and I love it, but we don't have time. So I'm just going to use those two examples because in, uh, in our world, those seem to be some prominent ones that, that seem to be making traction right now, but really, they don't have any legs, all right? They actually don't get you anywhere, okay? And any closer to describing reality or living it out. And that's another thing is a, a worldview must be lived out. So it, a worldview doesn't just offer answers, okay? It... it it actually is the way you live your life, okay? So if you actually watch someone, that's probably the best indication of what they actually believe, All right? So, you know, you say, yeah, people are just like a pile of cells, the same as a cockroach. I mean, that's what, that's what atheists and, you know, scientific, again, materialist reductionists would believe is you're the same as a dog, as the same as a bird, the same as a beetle. Like, there literally is no difference, okay? That's what they would say, okay? But, but that's not how they would treat you. <laughs> they don't write books for beetles, right? Nobody? You know, that's, there's no books for beetles or rabbits. Books for humans, 
Okay, so, so they, they don't treat you like you're just a dog. Okay? Uh, and, and, and furthermore, it's like I passed all kind of roadkill on my way here. I hate to be nasty, you know, after lunch. But there was a lot, okay? I won't describe it, but there was a lot. Okay, if there was even just a piece of a human finger on the side of the road, do you think we would just drive past like, oh, yeah, no big deal? No, no, FBI, everybody, CSI, all these people are going to come out just for a little human fit. Why? Because we actually know the value of humanity. We know it. It's there. (laughs) Uh, But again, we suppress it. Okay, I say we in some general sense of the world suppresses the truth again in unrighteousness, all right? Um, in fact, let's go look, turn with me to Romans 1 real fast. So we've got the light thing, so keep that in mind. And now go to Romans 1 and, uh, and, and check this, what Paul says here, because it, uh, it speaks to exactly what we're talking about right now. And it's this, notice, uh, go to verse 18 of, of Romans 1, that's the New Testament. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness since, here's the key verse that I want you to focus on, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, and we just read that one, God's invisible qualities, notice invisible qualities, His eternal power and his divine nature, in other words, have been clearly seen, (laughs) being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse or people are without excuse. Isn't that interesting? His invisible qualities have been seen. The invisible can be seen. And of course, some of the ways you can do that is through causality, right? So like, You've heard of the first, you know, uh, the uh, unmoved mover or first cause of something. So if something has a cause, right, like we see the effects of things. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me illustrate it this way because I don't want to get too, too far in and, and lose anybody. I woke up one morning and on my table, on my kitchen table, there were uh, flower petals laid out in such a way that it said, love you, daddy. Okay. Uh, now, I didn't come in there and say, oh, man, it's interesting. A plant came in here last night and lost all of its petals trying to plant itself in my table, you know? Um, I, no, uh, you would never see, think about this, you would never see in nature uh, words, not configured, not like that, not English, like I didn't know plants spoke English. You know? No, it was my little girl, okay? I immediately, okay, I see the effect. Uh, the cause is a little, you know, seven, eight, now eight-year-old girl that loves her daddy, right? Like, we see the effect. We know there's a cause. It's not nature. It must be something more than that, something with rationality, reason that knows language, Okay? And no animals, no language. Now, immediately people always raise it. Hang on, dolphins can communicate 100%. Animals can communicate in all kinds of ways. But see, the issue is language is not just communication. I can communicate by doing, making all kinds of noises and stuff, you know. My brother used to always, uh, 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 and I'd be like, he wants a cookie, you know. He wouldn't talk for the longest because I would talk for him. He would just grunt and point, okay. Animals can do all of that and have high, I mean, exquisite ways of communicating that we don't even understand fully yet, okay? But the issue, language is using a symbol. Right, it's use, animals don't do symbols. That's why we've never found any other animal than human that writes and draws pictures in caves. Animals don't do art like that. They just don't. And there's a whole reason why they don't, but it's too much for uh, too much. In fact, actually, if I could do a little commercial here, I do teach, I have a class here on worldview at KNBC, and we do go into some of this stuff in a much deeper way. So if it does interest you, which, again, we're talking about wonder, right? We're wanting to 
And by the way, wonder is not just like amazement. It's actually saying like, huh, I never have actually thought about that. I wonder about that, right? We look at the Grand Canyon and say, man, what could have done this, right? In fact, we look for a cause. What's the cause? Is it, is it just water running over for millions and millions of years? Or, or because that's, where's, where's water then? Okay, so then you got to go to water. Then you got to go to this. Then you got to go, and you keep backing it up to a first cause. And that first cause is actually what Aristotle discovered through general revelation, okay, without ever having a Bible, is an unmoved mover, one that's immaterial, infinite, so he has no magnitude. You can't measure God, right? And there's no end to God, um, which is why we can't ever understand God as, as, be, as contingent beings. Uh, an unmoved mover, a first cause. Now, Aristotle came to that in what? Uh, like 385, okay? He came to that conclusion, which is kind of taking us to the height of what Paul is saying here is that it's clearly seen causality all over the place, all over the place, all right? And you really know it, but what we end up doing, what he ends up saying, suppress the truth. We know there is a God. That's obvious, okay? That's the most obvious thing um, in the world, which is why the psalmist would say it like this. Only the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But we, we've done that. We've done that. We act like there, again, we go back to what I said. Worldviews must be lived, and that probably indicates the best sort of test on what you actually believe is how you live. How you live. And sometimes we live as if there is no God, that we get to decide what to do with our body, right? <laughs> um, which is the exact opposite of what Jesus does when he comes. He's, you know what Jesus does when he comes? He says, this is my body given for you. Our culture wants us to say, no, no, this is my body. I'll do what I want. No, not as Christians. Not as Christians. This is my body. You have what you want, Lord. Use me. Fill me. Um, so, we have a tough time living out our worldview. Even if in here we've got some of the things right. And, and listen, let's be honest. Again, let's all be humble. Worldviews are tough. Like, there's so many things in the world. And we're talking about worldview. Again, that's a lot. And all from my perspective, me supposed to understand that. It's a lot, okay? So we gotta get down to some basic things like origin. Where did we come from? God created us. In fact, God created us out of nothing. Somebody said ex nihilo? Yes, good. So ex nihilo, right? That's the fancy way of saying out of nothing he created. So in other words, it wasn't like God had something, because we can do that, you know? Like, what is a football? But, you know, I mean, a genuine football is like supposed to be pigskin, right? And it's like, uh, or, or, you know, my wallet, for instance, is leather, okay? We did that. We configured this leather into what we call a wallet, all right? This holds cards and this sort of thing. We can take something and make something else out of it. It's not what God does. There was nothing, okay, but him, nothing material, and then he created everything by speaking it into existence, by his word, all right, by his word. We come, come back to that term, word, which language is very important for us. Like all of us in this room, it's very important even today. And when, we, when we're singing, that we understand, like whole, you sung about holiness, right? Well, what is holiness, right? Man, that's a big question, you know? But we, we understand enough and, and, we, and we keep understanding, we keep washing over it year after year, allowing God and his map to guide us into the truth, all right? And so... But we know that there are certain things that are holy in the world. We just, we know it in our bones. And one of those are people. Just like we already said, you know, roadkill all over the place, all kind of animals, you know. Deer, I saw deer, dogs, like, ugh. But not a human. Because why? We know there's something unique. And what's unique, we're told in Genesis, right? Which is what? We're created in the image of God. Somebody said it. We're created in the image of God, the imago Dei, okay? The image of God. In other words, <laughs> we are to reflect him. 
We're to reflect him. Okay, now, um, we can, look, there's so much, listen, I got all kind of notes here that we can go. One last thing about a worldview is panoramic. You know what panoramic means? Just like on your phone, you take that long picture. Right? We need a worldview that's full. It actually deals with every, not just parts of our life. It deals with sexuality, all right, identity, psychology, right? It's like psyche, just mind, okay? It deals with our body. It deals with other people. It deals with even things that are metaphysical, okay? Hope, for instance, or love. Like, where's love? There's not a, there's not a love gene, okay? If you were to, um, you say, you know what? I'm dating this person, I think I love them. It's like, okay, cool. Well, go to the doctor, and ask them to run a test on you, you know? Do I really love this person? They can take your blood, right? And then, no, of course not. You know, that's not the way this works. I don't, I don't in the morning say, all right, kids, y'all enjoy my love. Here it is on the table. I'll be back with more. You know, no, that's, no, it's immaterial. Hope, immaterial. These are virtues, actually. Uh, faith, hope, and love. They're not something you can grasp with your hands or see with your eye. You can see the effects, but you can't see the thing. And God's like that as well because God is love. And he's the ground of all being, which means the fact that you even are today, you're standing, so to speak, on his substance, his rockness. Right? And so if he's the most substantive thing in the world, like the rock illustration again, there's no way to prove God by anything in this world. Because people always get upset, like, I, I, you, you can't prove God to me. It's like, well, not in the material world, no. Of course not. Because God is spirit. And those that worship him must worship him, what? In spirit and in truth. Now, <laughs> the Son of God throws a wrench into things, doesn't he? Because he becomes, and we're going to talk about this next, he becomes flesh. So the immaterial God who cannot be seen becomes seen and is seen eating fish with his disciples, right? Man, that's got to make you wonder a little bit. Like, wow, what kind of God is that? He actually enjoys eating. He's not mad at me. You know, he doesn't cut. You know what? You know what Jesus' first words are when he comes back from the dead after his disciples had betrayed him and left him all but John, all but John. You know what his first words are? What happened to you guys? No, no, that would have been my words. Like, bro, you know, if, if, if my buddy Rob would have, would have left me high and dry, I'd be like, bro, what happened, man? I thought, you, I thought we were in this together, right? No, Jesus doesn't come to, what does he say? You know what his first words are? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. He says it twice, actually, and John ends up saying it three times. Peace be with you. How many of you in this room are at peace with God? Do you know it's not on him that you're not at peace? It's on you. Because he has already proven on the cross that he wants to make peace with us. No matter what we've done. No matter what we've got ourselves tangled in. No matter what kind of darkness we've gotten into, no matter what kind of cave we got ourselves stuck in. He wants his light to shine. And you know, light is kind of the fundamental thing in order to even have a view of the world. So we can talk about lenses, and you know, you, your eyeball has a lens in it, right? So before we talk about a lens that we put on, because sometimes we think of like Christianity being something we put on, and that's fine to think of it like that, but we actually have an internal lens. That's that general revelation piece. It's called reason. God can actually speak to us in our mind. Did you know that? Isn't that awesome? Now, there's other spirits that can speak to us as well in our mind. We wrestle, and we even speak to ourselves. You ever notice how complex we are? We're kind of like this weird animal in the world that's unlike anything else. You know what I'm talking about? If you don't, then try to go run five miles right now in what you have on. You'll very quickly argue with yourself. Trust me, you will. Why am I doing this? You know, should I keep doing this? Like, who are you asking? <laughs> it's yourself, right? Like, your leg's are like, bro, we got we to gotta quit, you know? 
can't do this. You know? um, so your body's telling you one thing. Your will's telling you another. Your mind is like, I think we can push through this. I mean, he said to run five miles. I want to prove him wrong. You're arguing with who? With all of what you are. It's interesting. And of course, the Bible will say that the heart is kind of the control center of all of those things, of our emotions and so on and so forth. So at least that's the Old Testament um, understanding of it. Light, then, is necessary for this lens to work in here. In other words, if all the lights are go off, I can have my eyes wide open. And if there is zero light, which that would mean the sun ceased to exist, <laughs> uh, because even at night when we have light, it still bounces around because of the sun, not just the moon, because as you know, it's really the sun, okay? Think about Jesus in this way, okay? Light of the world. Um, if we had no sun, no light, you wouldn't be able to see anything if you had your eyes wide open. It doesn't matter what kind of, you could put three or four lenses on, all right? You wouldn't see anything. It would be total darkness. Interestingly, Genesis starts in darkness. You know why? Because we don't exist yet. It's not because God doesn't exist. In the beginning, God, in the beginning, our beginning, not God's beginning. God doesn't have a beginning, Right? And just like when you came to consciousness, all right, whenever that was, I don't know. I don't remember when I did, but I knew that I was. And you know that you're old enough now to know that you are, okay? That's like light all of a sudden, okay? Where's that light coming from? There's only one game in town, dear friends, and it's not atheism. It's not secularism. It's not all the isms. It's not all the other religions. There's only one game to be played. There's only one road to be walked, there's only one light that shines. It's God. That's it. There is no other. And the only way we can see it all or consider or examine our life in any form or fashion, in fact, even see today, is because of his light that shines. And that's a general light. It's general. Okay? It's going out to everybody. In fact, we're going to where we're headed in the next session is going to be Jesus is he's the light that lights every man coming into the world. Every man. You know what every means in the Greek? Every. <laughs> Just like when Jesus wants everybody to be saved, right? That's his desire. It's everybody. That includes you. It includes me. And that's, hey, that's good news. So we got to have his light and we need to recognize that when we see something beautiful in this world, like I saw that sunset this morning, Guess who that ultimately can be traced back to? When you trace the cord back to the wall, remember the effect, we hear the music, when you trace the cord back, it's the power, power of God. It's the power of God. And he's inviting all of us, all, right, all of us on this guided tour by this dude up here, you know. Um, I'm all over the place, trust me. I have ADD, so I'm sorry. If some of the things seem scattered, but it's the way my mind works. Um, we're guiding it back to the light, who is Jesus, okay? <laughs> uh, so we can talk about worldview, but ultimately we got to get past just our view and understand that the lens doesn't even work. Our view of the world doesn't even work without his light. Jesus, thank you for this time that we've had just to sort of explore some of your world and some of the key concepts that uh, are worth thinking about in order to examine our life. And we are called to examine our life. We're, con we're called to consider uh, not only our perspective, but Lord, this great world that you have created. This is your world. This is your world. And you're going to redeem it. And so Lord, we want to be a part of that redemption. We want to be a part of that new heaven and new earth that you are going to make, as you say in your earth life, making all things new. Make us new, oh Lord. Help those who are lost. Lord, I'm, I'm positive there are people here that feel lost, just, just confused, um, just scattered. Don't know where, who to trust. Being told this and that. Lord, would you bring your clarity this weekend? In all sorts of ways, as we have fun, as we talk in fellowship, as we have these sessions, as we have breakout sessions, 
As we worship you, Lord, would you make yourself known? Would your light shine? And we reflect that light, we pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Marshall Dack. Our next session coming up very soon is going to be with uh, instructor David Bagby from here at Kentucky Mountain Bible College. But we are going to take a five-minute break right now, just a couple of minutes, stand up, stretch, get the blood flowing a little bit, <clears throat> and in just five minutes, we will reconvene for the next session, so don't go away.
if it's coming out there to get your attention, but I can get it. Hey, everybody! Come on in! <laughs> I'm Rick Brookins, one of the instructors here at KMBC, and it is my privilege and honor to introduce the next speaker, a friend and colleague, Reverend David Bagby. He's an instructor here in Bible and Theology at KMBC, and he is homegrown. Man, that didn't get any cheers from anybody. <laughs> where, where are all the KMB, they, the KMB students must be out there? He's homegrown, uh, uh, raised here on campus for a lot of it, graduated from KMBC, and uh, graduated with his master's from West of Biblical Seminary, and now he is in a PhD program at Asbury Theological Seminary. Getting close, getting close. Oh, man, we know what that's like, but he's in his fourth year. Maybe a year or two more, and we'll be calling him Dr. Bagby. Won't that be great? He's been teaching here since 2016, an ordained minister in the Kentucky Mountain Holiness Association. He and his wife, Sarah, have two kids. And, and, and uh, David gave me an introduction that was a little more over the top than what I'm doing here. Uh, <laughs> and you know how you always look at your own kids as the best and the brightest and everything? Well, I didn't quite do that. But they are precious kids. <laughs> and we always look at ours as the best and brightest. So while he's not studying for classes to teach and classes to learn from, he enjoys playing with his kids and everything outdoors, including shooting. Any, any uh, of you like shooting? Hey, there you go. Talk to uh, Mr. Kirk Bagby and Mr. David Bagby, and they are all, all, all about shooting. So he enjoys being outdoors and enjoying God's creation. Please welcome Reverend Mr. David Bagby to the platform. Oh, thank you, Rick. I definitely wanted to put something there. My precious wife and my precious kids, they are definitely my, my life and my world and my joy. They are why I do what I do. And, uh, and So today I wanted to speak on the topic of Jesus through Old Testament eyes. As we heard from Marshall Begg, excellent session we heard just now. He said tonight he's going to be speaking on Christ. I told him I'm afraid I'm going to be stealing his thunder here, but Jesus is big enough for both of us to lecture on. So I'm sure he will have something different for that here tonight. So maybe I'll set him up for this coming session. So I love teaching here at KMBC. I appreciate a number of you who were in my Jeremiah class earlier today to see, to experience part of classroom. For me, teaching is not merely a job. Teaching is not a job. It's a calling and it's a passion. It's not a job, it's a calling and it's a passion. I'm blessed to be a product of the life-transforming education that KMBC offers as a 2015 graduate, and now I'm blessed to give back to that as a teacher in Bible and theology, primarily in Old Testament. That's what my doctoral degree is in, a PhD in biblical studies concentrating in the Old Testament. And I love seeing what the Old Testament says about who Jesus is and what it means to be his disciples. So it's Worldview Conference, and as Marshall Dagg has already set up, a bit of definition about worldview, perspective on the world, and how we answer the major questions of life. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? Worldview can definitely be framed in those major questions, how we answer the major questions of life, and also just who is God? Is there a God? How many gods are there? As Marshall set up so well, if you say there is no God, atheist, if you say I don't know, agnostic, well, there's many gods, polytheism, say there's one God, monotheism, say one God in three persons, we get to Christian Trinitarian monotheism. <clears throat> and also not just who is God, what God is like, but also what is humanity, who are we, where, where did we come from, what does it mean to be human? The Bible from Genesis to Revelation, from Genesis to Revelation, is about these two primary subjects. Is who is God? Who is God and who are the people of God? Who is God and who are the people of God? From Genesis to Revelation. When we come to the Gospels, those questions get narrowed down specifically to who is Jesus and what does it mean to be his disciple? Who is Jesus and what does it mean to be his disciple? How do we come into a saving relationship with God? Repentance and faith, as John the Baptist and Jesus and all Peter all preached. And what does it mean to live in a saving relationship with God, to walk with him in a holy life, the spirit-filled life? And my gospel students are getting this right now. They're very familiar 
with this question. I asked them, what are the two mo most important questions that all four Gospels answer? It's who is Jesus and what does it mean to be his disciple? For today's lecture, we're going to focus on that first question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Through Old Testament eyes, through the lens of the Old Testament. So an internal worldview, if you would, within Scripture. Viewing Jesus' role as the Messiah through the lens of the Old Testament, Old Testament theology. We're very familiar with the term that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is Messiah. We sing about it. Jesus, Messiah, name above all names. <clears throat> what does that mean? What does the name Messiah mean? <clears throat> John chapter 1, 41, we have at the beginning in John the Baptist's ministry, <clears throat> Andrew, one of John the Baptist's disciple, disciples, goes and finds his brother, brother Peter and says, we have found the Messiah. And then John, in parentheses, puts this, puts this parenthetical comment, which is translated Christos, Christ. And we have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Okay, but what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? What does the word Messiah mean? So <clears throat> I'm a teacher. I ask questions. So I just put it out there to you all. My students who have heard this before, you can't answer. <clears throat> what does the word Messiah mean? Any guesses on what does Messiah or Christ mean? Oh, good. That's why you're here today. If you all knew it, I wouldn't have anything to teach. So <laughs> if you all already knew it, any guesses on what does the word Messiah mean? There we go. I heard in the back, back, anointed one, anointed one. That begs the question, what does that mean further on, anointed one? So <clears throat> I am a biblical languages scholar, so you're going to get some Hebrew and some Greek for today. <clears throat> Our English word Messiah comes from the Hebrew noun Mashiach, Mashiach, just simply a transliteration from the Hebrew. <clears throat> when Hebrew is translated into Greek, the Greek equivalent is Christos, Christos, which is where we get our English word Christ. Just take off that nominal ending there, os, on the end of Christos, and we get Christ. We don't see the connection in our English language that Messiah is Christ and Christ is Messiah, <clears throat> but it's the same word, same title, same title between these two languages from the Old Testament, Mashiach, <clears throat> translated into Greek, first of all in the Greek Septuagint, <clears throat> when the Greek, when the Old Testament was translated into Greek around the third or second century BC, and <clears throat> the word that they used for Mashiach, anointed one, was Christ, Christos, Christos. And so what is the Messiah according to the Old Testament? Who or what is <clears throat> the anointed one? So the noun Mashiach, it does mean anointed one, as we've heard in the back. The noun even goes back further to a verb, mashak, mashak, which means is the verbal action of anointing, to anoint, or to smear, or to rub, <clears throat> or even to, to paint. And Jeremiah has a passage where he talks about painting a wall, and he uses the word mashak, to anoint, to smear, to spread. There's a passage in the Old Testament that talks about putting oil on bread. It's just simply buttering your bread, if you would. It says, you mashak, you anoint, you smear or spread. The next time you're at supper and you're buttering your bread, you're mashaking, you're mash mashaking your bread. You're smearing that butter on that bread. And <clears throat> even the word anoint or anointed one gets, has such a religious context today. So we talk about anointing. <clears throat> Where does this all come from? It comes from the New Testament via the Old Testament, in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, we see many messiahs, uh, mashiachs, anointed ones, and Jesus is the Messiah, capital T, capital M, Messiah. In the Old Testament, we have a basis for many anointed ones. In the Old Testament, the noun for Mashiach is used 39 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. The verb Mashiach, 86 times in the Old Testament. Here's a very famous, familiar image that shows us the concept of anointing and what an anointed one is and looks like. Here's Samuel, the prophet. He is told by God, go to Bethlehem, go to the house of David, and go mashak one of his sons. Go anoint him, anoint him to be the next king. As Samuel had just earlier done to Saul, go to the house of Kish, the son of Kish, Saul, and go mashak him, that he would be the Mashiach, the anointed one. Just a few passages in the Old Testament to get our frame of reference of this word mashiach. 
We have in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 5, then the Mashiach priest, the anointed priest, shall take some of the bull's blood, etc., making sacrifice offering. 1 Samuel chapter 2, 10, the Lord will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his Messiah, the horn of his Mashiach, the horn of his anointed, all the above. This is part of Hannah's prayer when she prayed for that son, Samuel, and the Lord has blessed her. And she is speaking, looking ahead to the coming anointed king. And I think Christologically, we can see the coming anointed Messiah, capital M, Messiah. 1 Samuel 16, 13, here's the image up there. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, and he mashocked. He smeared, poured, anointed that oil on David in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. A very key passage for understanding how does the Old Testament understand this idea of anointing, the Mashiach, the Mashiach one, the Messiah? It goes literally to the action, the ritual of pouring oil on your head. It sounds a little messy, but literally the symbolic action of pouring oil on a person's head, symbolically showing that this person has been God-chosen, God-ordained, and God-empowered, God-empowered. So... Where do we get the concept when we we pray to be anointed with the Holy Spirit, anointed with the Holy Spirit? We see it in the New Testament, yes. I say, go go back a little bit farther, even in the Old Testament, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And Isaiah chapter 61, I don't have that one up here, but Jesus quotes it at the beginning of his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has mashiached me, anointed me to preach good news to the poor. So there's another key passage messianic passage of the Old Testament, anointing with the Holy Spirit. King David, or David who's king in waiting, he's not king yet, he's on the run from Saul, has an opportunity to kill Saul, but says, no, the Lord forbid that I, David, should do this thing to my master, Saul, the Lord's Mashiach, anointed one, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing that he is the Mashiach, the anointed one. And we see that Saul was the initially the anointed king, the God-ordained king, and David has reverence for that, for the Lord. He's the rejected Mashiach, the rejected anointed one, and David eventually becomes the king of Jerusalem, the Davidic dynasty. We see this term of anointing, God choosing or ordaining people for particular tasks and particular roles in the Old Testament. We've got one more here, Psalm 2, 2. Excellent messianic psalm. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, that's the divine name, Yahweh, and against his Mashiach, against his Messiah, the anointed one. I teach psalms and wisdom literature class here, and when I teach Psalm 2, I ask, who is the anointed one in Psalm 2? Is that that David and the Davidic kings, or is that Jesus? Answer, yes. Answer, yes, all the above. Historically, in its historic context, Psalm 2 may have been a coronation hymn sung at the anointing of kings, the Davidic kings. But we see from a New Testament perspective, it's referring to Jesus. The psalm has images there that are directly applied to Jesus in the New Testament. Yes, the Davidic kings are Mashiachs, anointed ones, to be kings at that time. But they are pointing ahead. They're looking ahead down the tunnel of time to The Messiah, capital T, capital M, Messiah. Within the Old Testament, we see that there are three God-anointed offices, three God-anointed offices, God-ordained offices that were all ordained through this act, through this ritual of anointing, of of pouring oil upon the head. We see that, first of all, prophets are anointed ones. We see God telling Elijah, go and anoint the word is Meshach, and go anoint Elisha to be your successor. Go anoint Elisha to be a God-ordained, God-anointed prophet. We see priests are anointed, Leviticus 4, verse 3, 5, and 16, anointed priests, and also the high priest, Numbers 35 and 25. Again, the ritual of smearing, pouring the oil, pour the oil on Aaron and his sons, his, his head, and go down his beard, also anointing the thumb and also the foot as well pouring that oil. They are the smeared ones, the mashak ones, the ones that God has identified, <clears throat> ordained, and commissioned. They are the commissioned, ordained priests. And then, obviously, kings. The Old Testament has more to say about anointed kings than any of these other 
offices. Saul was Meshach, Meshach anointed, and then also David as well. So in all these passages, that Hebrew word, either the verb, the action, Meshach, or the noun, Meshach, the Greek Old Testament, the Greek Septuagint, it's Christ in all of these pictures. So you've got David in the Greek Septuagint, you've got David saying, don't touch, touch the Lord's Christ, the Lord's anointed one. <clears throat> so we have these three God-ordained offices, prophets, priests, and kings. This is how God is revealing himself to his people, how God is working in his salvation history. So these three offices are pointing ahead and going to coalesce into one figure, the Messiah, the Christ. You can already see where we're going with this here. How do we understand Jesus' role as the Messiah, the anointed one? Okay, that begs the question, anointed to do what? Anointed to do what? Aaron was anointed to be priest. Elisha was anointed to be prophet. David was anointed to be king. All of the above. All of the above for Jesus. Let's talk about these three God-anointed offices. Let's define them. Let's further clarify them. This will help us understand who is Jesus. Who is Jesus will help shape our biblical worldview of who is Jesus as the Messiah, as his role, who he is, why he came, came and how we relate to him, how we relate to him as our prophet, priest, and king. First of all, the prophetic office. It can be summarized by the very ubiquitous Hebrew phrase, thus says the Lord, many times in the Old Testament. Komar Yahweh in the Hebrew, Komar Yahweh, beginning the quintessential prophetic introduction. <clears throat> the prophets were God's voice to the people, preaching as well as foretelling the future. You and I, when we think of prophecy, we automatically think of future, and that's true, that's part of prophecy, but the pro Old Testament prophets were also preachers who were forth-telling to the people of their, of their, their day, and oftentimes repent, that you need to repent. Here's what you're doing right now, and here's what you need to correct. And the prophets of God, they are the ones who are pointing back to the law of God, and they're pointing ahead to the coming kingdom of God, and they're looking at the lives of the people and saying, your lives aren't aligning with either of these two poles. And they're pointing back to the law of God, the holy law of God, pointing ahead to the coming kingdom of God and saying, your lives are not looking like either of these poles. Repent, repent. And <clears throat> then we have another figure, another prophet come on the scene <clears throat> there in the Jordan River, a prophet, John the Baptist, preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And <clears throat> preparing, preparing the way for the prophet, capital P, prophet. And we've got the priestly office, the priestly office. What, what's a priest? Priests, in just one summary sentence, they are mediators between God and humanity in, in the sacrificial and temple worship. And a priest is one who stands between a holy God and an unholy people and mediates between the two, brings the two together in sacrificial worship. That you're an unholy people. You need atonement. You need a redemption. You need a sacrifice. And you need forgiveness of sins and cleansing of sins and so that the holy God can come down in your midst and live among you as a ho now holy people, a people that's been sanctified, a people that has been made holy through these sacrifices. And so the priests are the mediators and between God and humanity, and they needed to make offering sacrifices for themselves to sanctify themselves so that they would be holy and pure before they made their sacrifices. And the Hebrews writer will show that this is one area of departure between Jesus' priesthood, Jesus who was perfectly sinless, pure Lamb of God, did not need to make a sacrifice for himself before making the ultimate sacrifice for all. So then we have the office of king, the office of king in the Old Testament. It is a political office, a political office who rules God's people underneath God's authority, and that's key. The king is not above God in his law. He is under God as king, reflecting God's holy character, the kings, as the law of the king in Deuteronomy chapter 17, don't have time to go there in much detail, it lays out specifically what the king was to be like in the land of Israel. <clears throat> Through Moses, God says, when you get to the land, you're going to ask for a king, and here's what he's to be like. He's not like the other kings of the ancient Near East. The kings of the ancient Near East were all about power, pride, <clears throat> self-grandeur. They were basically megalomaniacs that were just bent on world conquest, and <clears throat> Big, multiplying big army, having lots and lots of wives and lots and lots of money. And God says, these three things, 
your king is not to do. He's not to multiply horses, have a big army. He's not to multiply wives, have a big harem. He's not to multiply silver and gold. This, this is completely decapitating the office of king in the ancient Near East. And every king in the ancient Near East is all about those. How big is my army? How big is my harem? How big is my bank account? And, but what is the king supposed to do? He's to be a good Bible college student. He's to be a good Bible college student. Deuteronomy 17 says he's to make a copy of Torah and he's to read it. Read it and study it and to live it and to model it. So yes, the king, it is a political ruler, but not like the kings of the ancient Near East. And he, he is to reflect God's character in studying uh, Torah. But he's underneath God's rule as king. In the Old Testament, we've got these two trajectories, God as king and the David as king, the Davidic king, the Davidic dynasty, the Davidic covenant. And you see these two parallel with each other. And oftentimes the Davidic king fails to reflect the kingship of God <clears throat> and so many times. But these two offices, or these two pictures, God as king and David as king, these two are going to coalesce together in Christ, who is, is God and is the king of the Davidic line. This is the genealogies of Jesus, that da Jesus is the son of David, the son of David. We see that a number of times in the New Testament, blind Bartimaeus, son of David, have mercy on me. Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy, <clears throat> Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the inheritor of the Davidic covenant and the Mosaic, or Abrahamic covenant. So we've got these three offices, the prophetic office, the priestly office, <clears throat> and the office of a king. All of them God-ordained, God-anointed in this ceremony of pouring the oil over their head, but symbolic of God's, also God's, not just merely symbolic, but in actuality of God's presence coming on them as a David. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that time onward. So it's not just merely anointing with oil, but anointing with the Spirit, anointing with God's presence. And as we see in David, also the, the prophets, they are ones who are speaking the prophetic word through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, etc. Let's look at Old Testament types for Jesus as the Messiah. Each of these three offices, we have a prototype, a prototype within the Old Testament that is fulfilled in Jesus. For the priest prophetic office, the prototype is Moses. The prototype is Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, Moses says that there is coming a prophet like me, him you will listen to. There is coming a prophet like me. And throughout Israel, Moses is, he's not the first person to be called prophet, but he is is a quintessential prophet that others are, are modeling. We have Samuel, prophet, Nathan the prophet, others, Elijah, Elisha, but they weren't the, the, the perfect prototype, the pro perfect example that Moses is the prototype. And the Jews were still looking for an anointed prophet, an anointed prophet, even in Jesus' day. We see that in John chapter 1, when John the Baptist starts preaching, they're like, who are you? Are you the prophet? Are you the prophet? They're they're going back to Deuteronomy 18 there. They're thinking, oh, maybe this is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is like, no, 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 no. He's coming later, and I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And, but Acts, Peter, Acts chapter 3, Peter is preaching. Acts chapter 7, this is Stephen's sermon. They both reference, quote, Deuteronomy 18 in reference to Jesus. That, well, this is what Moses was talking about. Moses talking about there in the second millennium B.C., he was speaking of Jesus as the... Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed prophet, the anointed prophet. What about priest? What about priest? <clears throat> we have this very enigmatic figure, Melchizedek, in the Old Testament there in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. We could spend <clears throat> hours lecturing on, on that. <clears throat> this enigmatic priest king, whose name Melchizedek means king of righteousness, he's king of Salem, peace. It's probably a location, maybe Jerusalem, some have speculated. Abraham pays tithe to him, coming back from a battle, pays a tithe, a tenth to him. And then we have the next reference, the next reference to Melchizedek in the Old Testament outside of Genesis, and, it, and the only reference is in the Psalms, Psalm 110, where we have the psalmist saying, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek mind blown. What, what is the psalmist talking about there? Then the Hebrews writer comes along 
with that benefit of hindsight, looking back in Jesus and the cross and interpreting Psalm 110 for us. Psalm 110, going back to Genesis 14, saying, oh yes, Jesus. And Melchizedek is fulfilled in Jesus as the perfect high priest, which is better, which is superior to the priesthood of Aaron. The whole book of Hebrews is about the supremacy of Christ, the supremacy of Christ. Jesus is better than the angels, chapter 1. Jesus is better than Moses. He's better than the Aaronic priesthood, Aaron's priesthood. Jesus, as priest, he did not have to <clears throat> make a sacrifice for himself to be, sanctify himself to be holy like the other priests did. The other priests, <clears throat> they always stood to do their work in the temple. He never sat down in the tabernacle in the temple going into the holy place. and the holy of holies, the priests always stood because their work was never finished, but the Hebrews writer knows this, that when Jesus, when he completed his work on the cross, it is finished, <clears throat> entered into the Holy of Holies with his own blood, the blood of the Lamb, as Christ sat down. Christ sat down at the right hand of glory. It is finished and completed, a once-for-all sacrifice, a once-for-all sacrifice, that all those sacrifices in the Old Testament, <clears throat> Leviticus and Deuteronomy and other and Exodus, and pointing ahead to the perfect Lamb, the perfect temple, and the perfect priest, all coalescing in Jesus. He is the Lamb. John 1, 29. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Priestly office. Priestly office. And John chapter 2, next chapter. Destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it again. He is the temple. This Jesus said, speaking of himself, his body, the temple. And he is, he is the priest, the Mashiach, the anointed priest. And king, the prototype, is definitely David. 2 Samuel 7, giving us the it's known as the Davidic Covenant, the Davidic Covenant. And, oh, I wish I could spend a lot of time on the Old Testament covenants, covenants, the Noahic Covenant, Genesis 9, the Abrahamic Covenant, 12, 15, and 17 of Genesis, the Mosaic, Sinaitic Covenant, and then the Davidic Covenant. The Davidic Covenant was a covenant of kingship to you, David, to you and to your family, and I give the covenant of kingship. You will not lack a man to sit on your throne forever. We see that picked up. In other passages, Isaiah, definitely Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, <clears throat> that there is a king who will rule and reign in Jerusalem, the Davidic city, sit on the throne of his father David to rule and to establish it. Jeremiah chapter 23, <clears throat> I could put in your Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter, chapter I think 34 or 37 talks about the Davidic king as well. And even when the monarchy ended in the Old Testament with the destruction of Jerusalem, the Babylonians come the Davidic king, Zedekiah, is taken into exile, and the, the Davidic kings are getting exiled all over the place. And <clears throat> we're left wondering, what about the Davidic covenant? What about the Davidic covenant? And then, oh yes, we see the genealogy of in the, in the Old Testament that Jehoiakim, the Davidic king, who went into exile in Babylon, he had a son, Shealtiel, and he had a son, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the first to lead the Jews back home in the book of Ezra. Ezra. But Zerubbabel, he's the Davidic line, but he's, he's never called king. He's governor. Governor Zerubbabel underneath the mighty Persian empire. The Persian kings are in charge as king, and he got Zerubbabel as governor. And so when, when is the king coming? Where is the kingdom being reestablished? When the Jews come back from exile, they rebuild the temple, get the Ah, sacrifices back. We got the priesthood back. They come back to the land. We got our priests. We got our temple. We got our sacrifices back. But where's, where's the king? Where's the king? Zechariah. Zechariah. <clears throat> that minor prophet. <clears throat> we call him minor just because they're smaller, not because they're unimportant. Oh, Zechariah is very important. He's preaching to the Jews in Persia and saying, Fear not, O daughter of Zion. Your king is coming. Your king is coming. He is humble, lowly, riding on a donkey, the foal of a donkey. Oh, yes, the gospel writers are definitely going to cue in on Zechariah 9.9 when it comes to Jesus' triumphal entry, the entrance of the king. The king is coming, he has come, and he will come again. The theology of the anointed king. Jesus as the anointed prophet, anointed priest, anointed king. In the New Testament, which New Testament books show Jesus' role as the Messiah, the Mashiach, the anointed one? Various books of the Bible emphasize these offices to a greater degree. The prophetic ministry is heavily emphasized in the Gospels. In Jesus' own day, they recognize him as a prophet. He is a prophet. He's more than a prophet, but he is that. that are, are you, like, a, they liken him unto Jeremiah or, or John the Baptist come back from the dead or, or Elijah? 
When Jesus raises the widow of Nain's son in Luke chapter 7, the people say, truly a prophet is among us, a prophet is among us. God has visited his people again. So Jesus in his own life was recognized as a prophet. What do prophets do? Prophets preach, prophets teach, prophets teach in parables. In the Old Testament, Nathan speaks to David in a parable. Isaiah, Isaiah 5 speaks in a parable. Who else speaks in parables? Oh, yes, Jesus. He takes on the role of a prophet. Who are the miracle workers of the Old Testament? Well, the prophets, the God-anointed prophets, Moses, Elijah, Elisha, a number of Jesus' miracles are reflecting the miracles done in the Old Testament, feeding of the 5,000, the giving of manna in the wilderness, and also a miracle I love in the Old Testament that's not preached on much, but Elijah feeds a hundred men, which is a few loaves of barley. And we're very familiar with the feeding the 5,000 of Jesus and the people in Jesus' day who knew their Old Testament. It's like, oh, that's, that's what God did through Elijah. That's what God did through Elijah. A prophet is among, among us. And the prophet's preaching, preaching to present needs, preaching of future things, predicting, predictive prophecy, <clears throat> preaching sermons miracles, parables. This is what Jesus does. Um, So when you start viewing Jesus through this lens, you start to understand some of the things he says and does. Uh, For for example, Matthew chapter 23, the discourse to the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And we see a series of seven woe oracles against the scribes and Pharisees. Well, that's what a prophet does. That's taking a prophetic stance. Book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5, we see a series of woe oracles from Isaiah. Woe to you, this and that, and elsewhere. So the people know, oh, uh uh-oh, this is Jesus putting on a prophetic word of judgment here in this case. We have the priestly ministry of Jesus. Certainly in the Gospels, in the crucifixion scenes, sacrificing, shedding his blood, the atoning blood, the actual event of the crucifixion. We see other priestly elements in the Gospels. John the Baptist who said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's a priestly function. Matthew 1.21, you will call his name Yeshua, Jesus, Savior, because that's what he's going to do. He's going to save his people from their sins. Save their pe- his people from their sins. A, a priestly sacrifice for salvation from sins. The Hebrews writer, the writer of Hebrews, makes explicit this typology from the Old Testament of, of a priest, of Melchizedek. Jesus is the priest forever. Jesus is the priest forever. He's the perfect priest, the sinless priest who did not have to make sacrifice for himself. He entered into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the Lamb himself. He's the priest who takes the blood of the Lamb, his own blood, <clears throat> before God, and he is God himself, and <clears throat> making atonement once for all sacrifice, once for all sacrifice, and he sits down. He's, he's done, finished with that, with the actual action of dying for our sins, but he still lives to intercede, to mediate, to mediate that sacrifice of atoning blood for every sinner who comes to him in repentance and faith and <clears throat> repents and believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed priest, to justify us, to forgive us of our sins, to regenerate us, to make us born again, and to sanctify us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he is the king. The Gospels show this, especially Matthew. Matthew is very keen on pointing out that Jesus is the God-ordained, God-anointed king in the book of Revelation. King of kings, Lord of lords, hallelujah. Start singing Handel's Messiah here. Matthew's Gospel, I could walk through the whole Gospel and show you how he points out Jesus as the king. Matthew 1, the genealogy of the king, Jesus, the son of David. Matthew chapter 2, the birth of the king. The Magi come and say, where is he born? King of the Jews. Matthew chapter 3, the introduction to the king. John the Baptist, who comes along preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus comes along, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the kingdom sermon, the sermon on the mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Fast forward to his triumphal entry. O daughter of Zion, here comes your king, humble and lowly on a donkey. Pontius Pilate, are you a king? Yes, you say so. <clears throat> the title on the cross, and <clears throat> Jesus Nazarenus, and <clears throat> Basileus, and Nazarenus, um, Jesus Christ, the king of the Jews. Jesus Christ, the king of the Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of, of the Jews. And then we've got <clears throat> Jesus as the resurrected king, the resurrected king 
Matthew 28, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, the commissioning of the king. And then Revelation shows us that he's the, uh, he's the resurrected king, and now he is the soon coming king, the soon coming king. He's not coming as a little baby in the manger again. He's coming on a white horse with a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth and proclaiming king of kings and lord of lords. And that's who we are looking forward, looking ahead to the return of the king. Just to coalesce all these together in a chart, just for you, for you visual learners, I like charts, I'm putting them together. So we've got three God-anointed offices, the three offices that were all called Mashiach, Messiahs, anointed ones, anointed prophets, anointed priests, anointed kings, the Old Testament types, Moses for the prophetic ministry, Melchizedek for the priestly ministry, and David for the kingly ministry, all coalescing into one figure, capital M, Messiah, capital C, the Christ. The prophetic ministry of Jesus, an earthly ministry of teaching and preaching, we see in the Gospels. The priestly ministry and his dying ministry is sacrifice on the cross, <clears throat> dying for the sins of the world. Seen in the crucifixion scenes, made explicit by the Hebrews writer, also Paul develops this in many places in his writings, the sacrifice of Christ. In his kingly ministry, the resurrected king who receives all authority in heaven and on earth. The one who has the right to rule and the right to command. A good and righteous and holy king. As Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 23, a righteous branch is coming. and His name shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And I love that in Jeremiah. It comes in the midst of a whole slew of wicked Judean kings, Davidic kings. And if you're a righteous Jew living under, under those kings, it's like, man, I don't want to live under these right, unrighteous rulers, these wicked rulers who are just leading us in sin. I, I want a righteous king, a righteous king who will lead us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. I want to live under that king. And as I look at our current political climate and such like that, we have lots of political rulers and politicians, but we have a higher authority, the highest authority, king of kings and lord of lords. The apostles there in the book of Acts, that we must obey God rather than above men, or rather than men, our highest authority as a king. As we're kind of winding down here, I want to pull together just various quotes throughout church history just to show this schema. <clears throat> this is not something that I've invented or looked at, invented or just come up with. And I'm a character from a long tradition, just not just from the biblical writers themselves, but in the last 2,000 years of church history, this has been a common way to teach of who is Jesus, who is the Christ. And he is our anointed prophet, he's our anointed priest, and he's our anointed king. And and this spans all the theological traditions. <clears throat> it spans in Catholic, Orthodox, Calvinist, Calvinist, Wesleyan. I've got a whole slew of comments from various <clears throat> Christians throughout the ages. And you've got John Calvin, the reformer in the 1500s. I'm not a Calvinist in my soteriology, but I appreciate this quote from John Calvin. He writes and says, the title, Christ, and he's correct there, it's a title, not a name. It becomes like a name in the New Testament, but it's first of all a title, the title Christ pertains to these three offices. For we know that under the law, prophets as well as priests and kings were anointed. Christ, Mashiach. Elsewhere he says, the realization of Christ's saving work is seen in three movements. Jesus first appears as a teacher in the prophetic office, then as high priest and lamb, sacrificed in his suffering and death, and finally by his resurrection, receives his kingdom and remains active in his office, reigning in his coming kingdom, the coming kingdom, which is both now and also not yet. That's coming in the future. We have the Heidelberg Catechism, which is a Reformed Catechism, in section 2, question 31. Why is he called Christ? Why is Jesus called Messiah? That is anointed one. So there they spell it out, define it. Why is he called Christ, the anointed one? Because he is ordained by God, the Father, and anointed with the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> Isaiah 61, to be our chief prophet and teacher, fully revealing to us the secret purpose and will of God, concerning our redemption to be our only high priest, having redeemed us by the one sacrifice of his body, and ever interceding for us with the Father, and be our eternal king, governing us by his word and spirit, in defending and sustaining us in the redemption he has won for us. A Greek Orthodox Catechism also says, 
He, Jesus, is the Christ, the anointed, not simply with oil, but with the Holy Ghost, to be the highest prophet, priest, and king, and raise us through these three offices from our fall. That is in these three offices as prophet, priest, and king that God is working to redeem us from the fall. <clears throat> Let's get a good Wesleyan here. Ah, uh, yes, John Wesley himself, <clears throat> as I very much appreciate John Wesley and his heritage and teaching. I am a Wesleyan Arminian in theology. John Wesley writes, I believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Savior of the world, the Messiah, so long foretold, that being anointed with the Holy Ghost, he was a prophet revealing to us the whole will of God, that he was a priest who gave himself a sacrifice for sin and still makes intercession for transgressors, that he is a king who has all power in heaven or on earth and will reign till he has subdued, subdued all things to himself. Works of Wesley, volume 10, page 81. So, got the references there for you. <clears throat> Another, a more modern theologian, Thomas Oden, who is a Methodist theologian, he writes, Jesus fulfilled and consummated these three offices as a prophet like Moses, whom God has raised up from among his own people, a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, and king of kings. There is an implicit chronology in this sequence. In his earthly ministry, Jesus first appeared as prophet, then in his suffering and death as priest, and only then in his glorification as ruler of the spiritual kingdom. And it's Thomas Oden's classic Christianity. If you want more on this, his, his systematic there of classic Christianity has a great section on Jesus as prophet, priest, and a king. Here's a final chart that comes from that book, Thomas Oden's classic Christianity. He writes, Jesus as prophet, he came to teach. As priest, he came to sacrifice. As king, he came to empower. <clears throat> prophet, Christ preaches. Priest, Christ atones. Christ governs. And pedagogy, that means teaching. Expiation, that's his sacrifice for sin. And king, guidance and protection. And prophet, his earthly ministry. Priest, dying ministry. King, his glorified ministry. Messianic beginning, messianic sacrifice, messianic consummation. And Mosaic type, Melchizedek type, Davidic type, and the rabbi, the teacher, the lamb who was sacrificed, and the end time governor. God revealed, humanity redeemed, <clears throat> redemption applied. How does this apply for you and I today? So that's who Jesus is. What does it mean to be his disciple? What does it mean to be his disciple? <clears throat> we come to him as our prophet, the one who reveals the will of God, the one who teaches us right from wrong, the one who teaches us how then shall we live. In this world, we have many voices preaching supposedly what truth is, saying this is how you can live and this is how you can live or such like that, but is it aligning with the true prophet, the true prophet who teaches us the will of God, who reveals to us how then shall we live? He is our priest. He is our God-ordained sacrifice once for all for sin, to solve humanity's problem of sin and selfish, selfishness, and that both actions of sin and also the principle of sin, are actions of sin that need to be forgiven, and then a principle of sin that needs to be cleansed and sanctified. As priest, he justifies us. As, as priest, he sanctifies us as well, sanctifies us wholly. And as king, he's the one who has right to rule right to command, the right to, to lead us and to guide us in life. And as king, he's a good king. He's not a dictator. When we surrender to God as king, we're surrendering to a righteous, a good and holy king. We're not surrendering to, to some <clears throat> dictator, but no, we're surrendering to a king who is also our father, another great picture of who God is in, in the Bible. <clears throat> surrendering to God as father and to Jesus and as the son, <clears throat> who are both king of kings and lord of lords. And so he is our king, and as king, we must surrender our lives wholly and completely, unconditionally to him as our ruler and our leader and our guide. And he is our anointed prophet, he's our anointed priest, and he's our anointed king. There's a hymn in our hymn book that says, praise him, praise him, prophet and priest and king. And thank you all. There's Jesus as the Messiah through Old Testament eyes. And Appreciate y'all coming out for today. God bless. Thank you, Brother Bagby. We appreciate that.
Next up, we have a variety of activities that will be happening. So we're very happy to introduce those.